Hello, everyone. Um, it is my honor to introduce uh, Christina today, who is a American historian in Germany, specializing in migration history and assimilation theory. She holds a PhD in history from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and is the author of four books and several articles dealing exactly with these, these themes. She's currently the a curator at the Baden-Württemberg State History Museum, the Haus der Geschichte Baden-Württemberg in Stuttgart, where she helped curate a special exhibition, American Dreams, A New Life in the U.S., um, which is still on display um, until July 28. And mm -hmm. I had the honor, mm -hmm. together with Regina Kunz, who, who is also here in, in, in the audience virtually, to see the exhibition in December uh, live. And it was such a fantastic experience that we, together with the German Society, the Library Committee, um, but also the GHI and of course the Moscata Center for uh, the Moscata Institute for thinking about how can we um, have this or share this experience with a larger audience because I, I'm very sure that a lot of people are curious to find out um, why, for instance, Henry Keppel had to travel back to Germany, you know, after such a long time. And I'm sure that Christina will give us more information about that. Christina, we are very happy that you're here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I hope you're having a good Friday. Um, so my goal for today is to give you a um, virtual visual orientation to our special exhibition. And I will be focusing extensively on objects from the German Society of Pennsylvania as well as talking about other Pennsylvania stories. Um, I have a lot of photos of the exhibition and um, a little video that a colleague made. And so um, I'm gonna go through and try to, um, for those of you who cannot visit us, hopefully give you a sense of what we are doing with your objects. Um, and I also wanna just extend my thanks to everyone also for your support of our exhibition. So, um, so just to do a brief overview, um, this, is, uh, this is our poster. Um, so our exhibition space is 500 square meters. The exhibition is in our special exhibition room which is a space in the museum that is dedicated specifically to special exhibitions. And the space is for a curator quite nice because it's quite large and is in effect a black box in that it's just a big rectangular room. We have complete control over lighting, over climate, there are no windows. And so we can really change the atmosphere of the space. And so if you came um, to see this exhibition and then you went to see another exhibition, you know, our next exhibition, or if you came um, two years ago and saw our previous special exhibition, it would be difficult for you to initially understand that you were in the same space because we're able to manipulate the environment so effectively. So in the American Dreams exhibition, we have seven sections. Five are thematic um, and two are um, multimedia visual. We have 34 stories in the exhibition. 32 of them are biographies and two are group stories. All of the text is in both German and English. It is a fully bilingual exhibition, which was something that was very important to our museum, particularly for this project. We have a total of 233 objects on display. 225 of them are loan objects. So almost everything in this exhibition came from lenders such as yourself. 
Um, a lot of these objects came from the United States. We have 15 different American lenders and they range from historical societies such as the German Society of Pennsylvania, other museums, libraries, archives, as well as private individuals. And then we have two multimedia stations, both of which use artificial intelligence to generate images. Um, and so far as of yesterday, we have had 12,236 visitors since we opened on November 17th. And this is um, so far um, a very good response from our public. We are getting a lot of school groups, which has been really wonderful. I think we, I think we are basically getting every high school English uh, class in the Stuttgart area and um, from farther, from not just to Stuttgart. So um, that has also been a very, very positive response. I can say I do school workshops and tours nearly every single day. Um, not Mondays when we're closed, but basically Tuesday through Friday. So this is um, our YouTube channel. We made a, a little video to introduce what the exhibition looks like. If you're curious, interested in going, um, like that very much. Um, this is our design schematic. So this came from our our design firm, um, a firm called Bureau Berlin in Berlin. And so here you can see um, we have the seven sections. So the first section, and then it kind of go, can you see a cursor? Is that apparent to you? Okay. So we try to sort of mimic a flag-like flowing um, movement. The, um, and I'll get into this more, the, the space is organized thematically and not chronologically. This is the entrance, but visitors do not have to start here at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> this is where our multimedia stations are. Um, so this is, is basically the design of the, of the space. So this is our introduction. It is um, a collection of video monitors showing interviews with young German high school students, um, some of whom have done exchange programs in the United States, talking about what they think um, the American dream is, what it means to them, their interests, their images, stereotypes of the United States. And this is um, our section, land of, free, uh, land of Freedom, Land of Freiheit. I'm gonna show a lot of photos and then I will get into each section and show more photos for each section. This is more or less for, for um, just to give you a sense of what things look like. This is the back end. The video monitor with the man in the suit is um, a video monitor at the end of the exhibition that has an interview with the Consul General in Frankfurt, um, Dr. Scharf, and he talks about his German heritage and his family's immigrant story. So we, we try to then connect these two um, perspective. So we start with the young German perspective and we end with the American perspective. Um, so this is our introductory text.
Christina, do you want to maybe read it out? Because really, maybe some people will not be able to, to read it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if I should read this out loud. Um, all right. Dreams move people. Over the course of more than three centuries, up to two million people left the German Southwest to start new lives in America. Many fled from hardship and persecution. The desire for political and religious freedom, as well as a longing for prosperity in a supposedly limitless country, were the most important motives for their departures. Reality often had little to do with dreams. The land was by no means empty. Emigrants from the Southwest sought cooperation with the indigenous peoples of America, and at the same time took part in their expulsion and destruction. Religious freedom did not lead to paradise on earth. The American Republic was neither perfect nor safe. The vast majority of immigrants did not become millionaires. And yet the dreams remained powerful. The exhibition tells the stories of successful and failed dreams with 32 biographies. Not not only reminds us of how close the connection is between Baden-Württemberg and the United States, it also shows the historical significance of migration for America and Europe in view of the current disputes over immigration. So this is what you see when you come into the entrance. So that's this text here. So this is our first section, and we call it Virgin Land. And the text reads, European colonizers thought of America as a virgin land, as untouched land just waiting to be developed. It was considered a manifest destiny for whites to take possession of the continent. But the land was not empty. In the year 500, 1500, Around 7 million indigenous people lived in North America. Infectious diseases, aggressive resettlement policies, and violence reduced their numbers to 237,000 in 1900. People from Baden and Württemberg were part of the European invasion from the start. Many dreamed of being able to buy good farmland cheap, cheaply. Some encountered Native Americans as interpreters, researchers, or settlers and as perpetrators, sometimes also victims in armed conflicts. And so this is um, some several of the display cases in this first section, Virgin Land. This section has um, a rather strong focus on Minnesota in particular, and the interactions and conflicts between German immigrants and the Dakota peoples in Minnesota. So our next section <clears throat> is called Beloved Land. And the text says, the biblical story of the exodus of the people of Israel to God's promised land of Canaan is one of the most powerful migration myths. In the 17th century, dissidents from England interpreted the emigration to America as a divine mandate. Quaker William Penn established Pennsylvania, Penn's woodland, in 1681 as a holy experiment. His colony was to become a place of refuge for persecuted fellow believers in Europe. Many separatists from Southwest Germany <clears throat> excuse me, followed this call. Despite cultural prejudices against Catholics, nuns emigrated from Baden to the USA after 1872 in order to remain teachers. <clears throat> and the freedom of religion guaranteed, <clears throat> excuse me, the freedom of religion guaranteed in the US constitution also protected non-believers. So this is the um, section that focuses on religious freedom and this idea of America as a so-called beloved land. 
And here we have um, a couple of stories from Pennsylvania that I will explain in more detail later. So our third section is called Land of Freedom. <clears throat> and the text reads, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Since 1903, these lines from a poem by Emma Lazarus on the Statue of Liberty, dedicated in 1886, has greeted arrivals at New York Harbor. As the first modern republic, the United States was a haven for the oppressed. After the failure of the 1848-49 revolution, around 4,000 politically persecuted people fled from Southwest Germany to the US. But the promise of freedom did not apply to everyone. Sick or penniless immigrants can be denied entry at the border since 1882. Black Americans were enslaved in many states until 1865 and then afterward suffered from racial discrimination. Many Native Americans were not allowed to become US citizens until 1924. Women's suffrage was not fully granted until 1920. So this then looks at the land of freedom section. And this is another photo of that section. In this section, we have several examples of 1848 revolutionaries who came to the United States. That's an important theme um, in this section. This section also has um, a story devoted to the Turner Society, the Turnverein, and um, many of our stories are of people who were active in the Turnverein also. And this is another view of the Land of Freedom section. So our next section is called Land of Rescue. And the text says, after the Nazis seized power on January 30th, 1933, Opponents of the regime were persecuted. Jews were expelled and robbed. After October 1934, they were only allowed to take 10 Reichsmarks with them into exile. In 1941, the state confiscated their assets that remained in Germany. With the start of mass deportations to labor and extermination camps in 1941, legal departure for Jews was forbidden. But even before that, Jewish Germans were often unable to emigrate due to the unwillingness of receiving countries to accept them. The U.S. had a national immigration quota starting in 1924. In 1938, only 27,370 of the around 300,000 German visa applications were approved. Scientists with employment contracts were exempted from the quotas starting in 1933, as were artists, writers, and other highly skilled professionals beginning in 1940. And so this is a photo of um, one part of this section. Um, it actually is looking at the case of a young man who um, initially went to Switzerland and then has managed to get a visa to the United States. Um, and both of his parents uh, died before the war. And six months after he arrived in the United States, he was drafted into the American army. And so this is his army uniform. And so he returned to Europe as a um, as a soldier. Um, it's a it's a very powerful story, and we use it a lot with our school groups um, because he was only a year or so older than they they are now when he had to um, leave Germany. 
So then our last section is called Land of Opportunity. The text says, the rise from rags to riches is the prototype of an American fairy tale. Anyone can supposedly get rich through hard work. Western expansion and technical innovations open up opportunity for advancement, especially for many whites. But the myth of the self-made man ignores unequal starting points and weakens social solidarity. Everyone is responsible for his or her own failure. The hope for a better life lured many women and men from Southwest Germany to the US. Only a few managed to rise to the top. But for many, the humble dream of owning a home, a secure income, and a better future for their descendants has come true. And this then looks at, at this section, this in particular focuses on um, the objects belonging to um, a woman who emigrated in 1992 to um, go to university in New York City. Um, she has a very interesting career and, and life as an interior designer and architect. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about Kepler. That's why we're all here, right? So, um, we wanted to um, tell Kepler's story because we thought he had a really interesting life and he could play multiple roles in the exhibition, possibly. We borrowed three objects from the German society um, a portrait of Kepler from uh, Gutekunst, um, his family book from 1766 to 1787, and a um, one of your record books from 1914 to 1938 that shows um, the registry of people seeking assistance from the German society. So let's get the video going. So this video is supposed to recreate what you might see if you were here in the space and walking to the Kepler um, case. Right. Okay. This is another view of the Kepler section. And a bit closer. And so this is then our introductory text. Did the later regretted, quote, sins of my youth and transgressions prompt Johann Heinrich Kepler of Treslingen to emigrate in 1738? That year, more Germans emigrated to America than ever before. 30% of passengers died while traveling in the overcrowded ships. The normal mortality rate was 3%. Kepler never forgot his traumatic crossing of the Atlantic. As a successful businessman and ship owner in Philadelphia, he campaigned for improved transportation conditions. He founded the first German society in America with 64 other German Americans in 1764. 
This organization tried to relieve poor fellow countrymen the start in their new homeland until the 1940s. So we also have um, some other stories from Pennsylvania that I thought you might find interesting. And they are um, Conrad Weiser, who emigrated in 1710. Um, each, um, each biography has a little slogan or a little phrase. And so for our Weiser, we call him the migrant as mediator between worlds. And he was from the Palatinate and he was an interpreter um, between the Six Nations peoples and the, um, the British. And he lived most of his life in Wommelsdorf. And then we have um, Conrad Beisel who emigrated in 1720. And he was the founder of the Efrata colony. And then we have George Rapp, who emigrated in 1803. And he was the founder of the Harmony, New Harmony, and Economy colonies, which are now at Ambridge, the Ambridge, um, uh, I think it's called the, um, the Economy Museum in, at, at Ambridge. And both Beisel and Rapp are in the beloved land section. Their, their museum cases face each other. And then we have Albert Schoenhut, uh, who emigrated in 1866, and he was the founder of Schoenhut Toys in Philadelphia, which by um, World War I was the largest toy factory manufacturer in the world. And then finally, we have Charlotte Bear Petty, who emigrated in 1947, and she was the first German war bride. And she settled in Philadelphia with her husband and, um, and daughter. And her daughter is the one who loaned us um, her objects. So I'm gonna go through and show some photos of the um, these sections, these stories. So this is the visor section, excuse me. Um, and the text here says, the whole de no sao nega, six nations or Iroquois, called Conrad Visor from Gros Asbar, Tara Chiwagan or Sky Guide. The 14 year old spent his first winter in America with the Mohawks and learned their language and politics. His father's hope that quote, bread could be obtained more easily in the new world than in Germany had been bitterly disappointed. As contract workers for the British Navy, the Palatines were supposed to harvest tree sap for ship tar, which failed. They starved, rebelled against their English masters and moved illegally to other colonies. In Pennsylvania, Visor rose to the rank of Justice of the Peace and was the official interpreter between the British and the indigenous Americans from 1732 to 1758. So this is the Bicel, um case. And these objects um, are from Efrata and the American Folk Art Museum in um, New York City. So the text reads, in Europe, quote, the sun hath set at bright midday. America, on the other hand, quote, sees a lily blooming whose perfume will spread unto the heaven, he heaven proclaimed Conrad Beisel in his fifth parish newsletter. The radical pietist Baker had been expelled from Heidelberg in 1718 and now sought his salvation in America. He found refuge in Pennsylvania, William Penn's colony, which had been conceived as a holy experiment. 
From 1724 on, the mystical prophet gathered around him a growing number of followers hungry for redemption. With the sanctification of Saturday and adult baptism, they set themselves apart from other Protestant dissenters. In 1732, Beisel founded the Ephrata Monastery on Kolakalico Creek, excuse me, which existed until 1813. So facing the Beisel story is the story of George Rapp. And the text reads, quote, brothers, the time has come for us to set out for North America, the promised land. With this song on their lips, about 700 people from Northern Württemberg set off for the US from 1804 onwards. They followed their prophet, George Rapp, a charismatic linen weaver from Ippingen, who had been scouting out possible settlement locations in America since mid-1803. They derived their mission to prepare for the millennial kingdom of peace by going out into the, quote, wilderness from the apocalypse of John. At 10 years, they founded a new town, harmony, new harmony, and economy. The Messiah did not come, but the settlements flourished. So this is then um, the Schoenhut section, and we were fortunate to find a collector who has um, collected many of his toys. And so we have a really beautiful example of this uh, model circus that um, Schoenhut toys used to manufacture and was their main product for many years. So the text reads, a story out of a fairy tale the eldest brother gets the father's toy factory. The youngest son moves abroad at the age of 17, frustrated. There he builds from humble beginnings the largest toy factory in the world. Six years after emigrating to Philadelphia, the woodturner Albert Schoenhut from Göppingen opened a small workshop for toy pianos. For him, work was enjoyment and nothing pleased him more than inventing a new toy. In 1912, the company had around 500 employees, but his six sons were unable to save Schoenhut toys from the, from the crisis suffered by the toy industry during the Great Depression. In 1934, they had to file for bankruptcy. So this is the Charlotte Ware Penny. Um, case, quote, miss my Dave so much, wrote Charlotte Petty, nee Ware of Ladenburg in her calendar, quote, all day without my love. On December 30th, 1945, she had married the American ex-sergeant David Petty, making her the first, and for a long time, the only one of around 12,000 German-American war brides. Until December 1946, American military personnel were forbidden to marry Germans, so Petty had to resign from the service to marry Charlotte. But when he had to return to the U.S. in September 1946, his heavily pregnant wife was not granted a visa. The father was not present at the birth of their daughter, Vera. It was not until October 1947 that mother and daughter were able to join him in the U.S. So this now is a new section. Excuse me. Um, and I want to show you a bit about how we are using artificial intelligence in our exhibition and particularly how we um, are using the Kepler story. So this is uh, a little bit of what you would see. Uh, it's very hard to um, recreate this with still images, but please uh, bear with me. So we have what we call the info point, and this is a um, multimedia station that um, we use our various 
biographies from the exhibition as a jumping off point to explore broader contextual issues um, related to migration, such as means of travel, laws and regulations, the experience of adjusting to life in a new country. Um, we have basic issues of many of our visitors, if they you know, have only been educated in Europe or in other countries, not the United States, don't know when or what the Civil War was. Um, they don't necessarily know um, how American political parties have developed and changed over time. Um, so there are a whole host of issues that we try to use um, this multimedia station as a, as a way of, of trying to share this with our visitors um, so they better understand the stories in the exhibition. So we have um, two um, AI generated images of Kepler. I personally find them a little strange, but my opinion doesn't really matter in this case. Um, but so one is him as a, as a young man and then one is a more mature man. Um, and we um, have created these postcards and these postcards are distributed around the exhibition most of the stories have them. So if you are standing in front of the Kepala case and you see this postcard, it's an actual postcard on the back. You can write an address and use it to mail this card to someone um, anywhere. Um, so the, the Kepala postcard um, here has then this hashtag of Zegel ship or sailing ship. And so this then tells you that here you can learn something about um, sailing ships and the role that sailing ships played in migration. And um, to try to make it fun, um, particularly for younger people, we then have these little phrases. Um, and so because Kepler was involved in shipping and in um, migrant transport, we tried to imagine scenarios um, and so one idea would be Kepla is sitting there and he's looking at a register and he says, oh, I, I see only 14 passengers. And so how much how much would I earn from this from this trip? Um, so this is the first page in the multimedia station for Kepler. Um, and then we then move on to different objects that don't have anything to do with Kepler specifically, but are related to this larger theme of the sailing ship. So we start with an image of an advertisement for his ship, the Charming Nancy. And the, te uh, the text here reads, so it's an advertisement for this ship from 1737. And the text reads, Kepler sailed from Rotterdam to Philadelphia on the Charming Nancy in 1738. He later became a ship owner himself and benefited from the emigration business. In the 18th century, merchants discovered transporting American immigrants as a source of income. This meant that the merchant ships that brought colonial goods from America to Europe did not have to return with empty cargo holds. The ships sailed irregularly. Migrants often had to wait for weeks at the port. So here you can see, we take the Kepler example, we try to then use it to transition to this larger theme of 18th century sailing ships and migrants who were traveling in these ships. And then the next, um, image in the, the Kepler section of the multimedia station is then this graphic, um, which is a cross section of a sailing ship from 1854. And the text reads, until the 1860s, most European emigrants crossed the Atlantic on sailing ships. The journey usually lasted six to 12 weeks. Passengers who could not afford a cabin traveled in cramped and unsanitary conditions in steerage. Initially, they had to provide and prepare their own food on board. 
there were few protective regulations. So you can see how we have gone from very much Kepler, and now we have transitioned to this larger context of the sailing ship experience for many migrants. Um, and then we also use Kepler to talk about regulations. So here we have an example of regulations from 1840. And the text says, ships have been sailing regularly between Bremen and America since 1822. As early as 1832, the Hanseatic city issued the first regulations in Germany to protect emigrants. There were regulated prices and minimum space requirements. This enabled ship brokers to attract customers. Although passengers were now guaranteed one hot meal per day, the food was still monotonous, potatoes, hardtack biscuits, beans and peas, as well as dried salted meat and fish. And we also use Kepler here much uh, as a much younger man, supposedly, to talk about the concept of freedom of movement. <clears throat> and so here we talk about the issue of manumission fees, which was an issue for people who were trying to leave Germany, particularly in the 17th and 18th centuries. And we have this then little imaginary fantasy conversation where Kepler is supposedly talking to a friend. He says, you can emigrate, we are not in Bavaria. Um, and this is a reference to restrictions that the king of Bavaria had imposed um, at a certain point prohibiting his subjects from emigrating. And this was not the case in Baden and Württemberg. Um, for any of you who, who has have spent any time in Baden-Württemberg, you understand that <clears throat> showing that we are, of course, better than Bavaria is very important. <laughs> so, so that's uh, that little dig to our neighbors. And so then the first object in this section is a petition to waive these fees from 1751. And the text says, in many German-speaking territories, such as Bavaria, the rulers at times banned emigration. In Baden, one was basically allowed to emigrate. However, indentured servants had to pay their masters 23% of their property as a form of release money, the so-called manumission and death fees. This request from those wanting to emigrate from Hagesfeld to waive the death fee was rejected. Many emigrants, including Kepler, simply disappeared without informing the authorities. And then further transitioning, we have this painting by Karl Hübner, The Emigrants from 1846. And the text reads, the Baden government viewed emigration as a loss of subjects in the 18th century. In the mid 19th century, politicians realized it was cheaper to pay poor people passage to America than to provide for them. They also hoped to nip social unrest in the bud. Between 1850 and 1855, the Baden government paid for the passage of 62,444 local poor. In his painting, The Emigrants, in 1846, Carl Wilhelm Hubner depicted emigration as a sad fate. So I think I am done with my presentation. I um, want to say thank you very much for your time and attention. And um, I guess there are supposed to be questions, um, comments. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation.